Okay, everybody, welcome back to Philosophy for the People. It's Wacky Wednesday. I'm here with Dr. Jim, and we are going to take whatever questions you send our way, but we first want to begin by talking about how to think like a philosopher, how to be a better philosopher. And yeah, I think that'll be a fun topic. But sure. uh, before, yeah, before we get into it, uh, I'm in a different location, as you might notice, like it seems really blue in here, doesn't it? It does. Um, it does. This is my child's bedroom. And I have been um, <clears throat> sent up here because there is a homeschool invasion in my house. So at any point, if you hear a bunch of screaming downstairs, you will know the children have gotten out of their cages and I might have to momentarily. Brent, Brent, uh, yeah. Pat got sent to to his room without a snack. <laughs> no, I literally did, man. I'm yeah. up here. I'm up here hungry and alone. Yeah, this is a bunk bed. Yeah, you guys want a tour of my <laughs> my daughter's. This is Mira, Mira and Marin's room here. It's very uh, fish themed. Very blue, very water, ocean-like stuff. So there you go. Uh, what do you, what's up, man? Good to see you, as always. Long time you, no talk since this morning. All right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. All goes well here, man. I'm uh, I'm having a good day. Uh, tomorrow, I'm traveling, so uh, odds and ends to deal with that. But other than that, a good day here. Good day. Good day. Did you get your 300 swings today? Uh, no. I haven't done any exercise since I came down with a... Oh, that's a particular right. illness uh, the just other a, day. Some spring allergies. Just some, just some spring allergies, right? So as as you know, uh, the other day, these spring allergies gave me a pretty nasty headache and some muscle cramps, which <laughs> were reminiscent of some other sp potentially spring allergies that I had yeah. a few other times. Uh, fortunately, this time I'm much more mild. So I'm feeling <laughs> almost back to 100% today, which means I'll probably get back on the exercise train tomorrow. Yeah. The, uh, the, the telltale... Uh, soreness in the lower nethers for me for the spring allergies yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a peculiar it's a peculiar symptom, peculiar uh, symptom yeah. <laughs> but, uh, a but i've met a number one. of fellas who have had it when, it's a distinguishing yeah, yeah. symptom yeah. to be sure yeah. yeah so uh all right let's uh let's dive in uh good professor you've been you've yeah. been a philosopher for many many years and you've tried to raise other philosophers so i thought it might be useful uh to pick your brain and i'll have a few yeah. things to share myself about how do you how to think like a philosopher? How to be a better philosopher? What what, what sort of disposition? Because yeah. this is sort of your attitude, as I understand it, that to be a philosopher yeah. is to just take a certain disposition toward life, to to refuse yeah. to live a sham existence. So I want to hear what yeah. you think this this means practically, yeah. and how and how people can acquire that disposition, if you will. Yeah, mm -hmm. I um, you know, the old the older I get, I was I was actually just thinking about this this morning while I was working working out, right. Um, the older I get, the more I, I've I, I come into this conclusion. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but I'm kind of on the way to this. Is I think there really are two philosophers, and they're they're Plato and they're Nietzsche, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the bookends of the history uh, thus far, of course, right? And it and I think that because though they they come to you know, on the the kind of the basic philosophy one-on-one -on -one readings of them, they come to very different conclusions, right, about uh, the ultimate nature of things. Uh, they both, I think, think of philosophy in the same way, right? They think of what it is. Like, they think what the, they see the philosophical disposition as very similar, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, they ha and they have different attitudes towards the relative value of it, too, okay? Um, and, you know, in as you know, like, I, I don't, unproblematically use Plato and Socrates interchangeable. I think, I think we can see there are rifts between them. Right. right. Um, but, you know, Plato does have Socrates, you know, define philosophy as this commitment to the principle that the unexamined life is not worth living. Right. So, you know, above all, go with the Oracle, right. And know thyself. Okay. So, so I see, um, you know, philosophy, first and foremost, we take it from its, you know, founder, you know, as, you know, we have it today in the West, right, from Socrates, from Plato, right. then what is philosophy? It is, it is, is an, an, an insistence on a kind of self-knowledge, okay? And um, now, we moderns hear that, and it, and it becomes like a narcissistic thing, like, who am I, right? Like, we, we, we see it, the, like the eyes of Jean Valjean in Les Mis, yeah. right? Okay, who am I personally? What's my personality? I don't think that's what, I don't think that's what the Greeks meant by self knowledge. Okay, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think at the end of the day is like like first and foremost to be a philosopher is to insist on knowing what I really am, like what is my actual standing in the world, right? 
And I think like the, the for me, and you've heard me rant about this before, like the, the paradigm non-philosopher is is Oedipus, right? Mm -hmm. He he does not have, have self-knowledge. He is unwittingly participating in error and evil, right? Maybe not so unwittingly, but he's participating in error and evil because he's denying himself a real critical look at himself, his standing in the world, the civilization he's inherited, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now fast forward that to Nietzsche's um on the genealogy of morals, right? Like kind of like my second, my favorite book being like the Republic, my second favorite book being the genealogy of morals. The first line of that is we knowers are the least well known to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So like he begins by like evoking the Socratic, you know, dictum, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And Nietzsche too insists on self-knowledge. Just at this point, he thinks it's become much more problematic for us to gain it. Like we know that there are kind of def defeaters abroad there to trick us in ways that maybe, um, you know, that, that that that's kind of what modernity is, is to say, like, it turns out we were massively wrong about a lot of stuff. And now we have to worry about where we're massively wrong in general and maybe even about ourselves and our own standing in the world. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so what is it to think philosophically? It is to me, it is an absolute insistence on not accepting my own BS, <laughs> right? Not accepting the easy, convenient stories about myself. But by self, I mean like like who I am as an inheritor of a certain civilization, right? Right. It is it is it is a it is a willingness to put things to critical scrutiny. And as you as you like like quoted me earlier, saying like for me to be a philosopher is to to refuse to live a sham existence, right? Yeah. And how do I do that? Um, I think I think it's it really is a matter of humility, right? It is being more concerned about not being a sham than it is to appear to be right. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant, man. Uh, so that's 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 awesome. I always love love hearing your take and perspective on this, and that and that always seems right to me. Here's here's kind of a more personal question. Do you think a philosopher requires OCD? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I don't think so, right? But I do think but it helps. Kind, <laughs> I think think certain kinds of philosophers uh, are attract. Certain kinds of philosophy definitely attract that, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I no, do. I do thought, think, yeah. though, like a philosopher does, it does to be a philosopher, like requires an unwillingness to leave well enough alone. Right. Yeah. Just because things are going smoothly does not mean things are going well. Right. Right. Um, like Oedipus, things are going very smoothly for Oedipus at, at a certain point, but they were not going well. Yes. Right. And he refused to see it. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So I was I, I had in mind just like other more practical tips, but I like the the term yeah. that 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 you're you're taking. Yes, I think sorry. I think that I think yeah. well the practical things that I was going to mention and will mention here in a minute. Um, I think support everything that that you're saying. It's interesting you brought up this idea of philosophical anthropology, right? Just concerning. Yeah. Who are we, right? And um, you're right. Nietzsche and Plato are both very concerned with this, even though they ultimately come to very different conclusions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly think that philosophical anthropology, like any pretty much discipline of philosophy, is not something that can be thought about or answered in isolation, right? Um, right. It's something that you can glean, uh, hopefully, some understanding of in relation to other aspects or branches of philosophy. So one of the things yeah. I was going to talk about, and I want to get your thoughts on it, is that to me, a good philosopher, a true philosopher, has to be a generalist, right? This idea of hyper-specialization. Yeah. Uh, while useful and interesting in some respects, I think has been really philosophically crippling, especially in sort of academia, right? Yes. Um, where you know, there's there's the cliche, what is it that you learn um, everything you can about one particular little thing until you essentially know everything about nothing, right? I mean, yeah. that, that is absolutely yeah, I mean, true. So yeah, I mean, talk to me about generalism yeah. and philosophy. I mean, and so how this es is yeah. Essentially, what has happened is the academic discipline philosophy, right? And note, I, like, I don't see that as necessarily being a philosopher, right? The academic discipline of philosophy has been co-opted by a model of research, right? That it was originally, you know, developed for the purposes of the, the natural sciences, right? You know, where, where you don't necessarily need somebody who has a view of the whole thing. You just need, you need research programs that you can farm out the work on sub problems and sub, sub, sub problems to various bureaucratized specialists, right? right we just yeah, like teach true. people the method and then we give them a particular problem and they'll solve it and the parts just add up to the whole, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now there's even worries about how good that is for science, right? When you don't, there's no one chemist who understands chemistry as such now, right? Okay, um, but, but all so so in the 19th into the early 20th century, you know, decisions were made that this was going to be the model for all academic disciplines. They had to become scientific, and this was part of what it meant, mm -hmm. is that they had to now 
justify themselves in terms of discernible research programs that could then be farmed out to bureaucratized individuals, people with standard sets of skills that can solve problems and then move on to the next one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, you know, we could, we could, we could say that's made progress and that it's produced a metric S ton of journal articles. Okay. And it's gotten a lot of people tenure and all that myself included. Um, but, you know, whether or not that has anything now to do with what, let's say, Socrates had in mind, uh, you know, in in, uh, in, in, the, in in Athens is it is, I think, clearly has nothing to do with that. And moreover, is that really what is important in uh, like training people as part of a general liberal education at its secondary level? I don't think so at right. all either. Do you, you right. see what I mean? So yeah. so I think like that that model right is way off way off whack and has very little to do with what. I think of philosophy as, yeah. and I see my job in the, you know, academic industrial article complex mm -hmm. is really just the way, you know, I've got my work week down to 14 hours so I can spend the rest of my time actually doing philosophy. Doing actual philosophy. Yeah, yeah exactly. I love it. Yeah. You have such a great yeah. way of describing the, the situation. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir. <laughs> you, don't, you don't despise it at all, clearly. Um. I don't, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Well, I mean, I'll say this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's gotten... It's 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 giving me the leisure time. You do the academic philosophy, so you can do the actual philosophy. Yeah, I love it. it's yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, it, it's right. right. I mean, if you follow, um, I always love Norris Clark and the way he thinks about it. You know, philosophy is taking that critically reflective term we should talk about to illumine the human experience and human person, and set it in relation to the whole, and set yeah. it in relation to the whole. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I think I think we all need to specialize to some extent, but the hyper specialization I think has been a detriment yeah. to true philosophical development for any human being exactly. who's been who's been sucked I mean, into it. Right. Uh -huh. It's an interesting question of like how many truly great books have been produced in the Anglo American university by philosophers in the last hundred years. Like truly mm -hmm. great books, books that we expect to be read two hundred years from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very few. Right. And mostly in cases by people who have eschewed that like highly specialized view. Right. 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 Let me let me in related to that, let me throw out the, some of the things I was thinking about and then you can tell me yeah, what definitely. you think of them and and which ones you hate. Um, so one of the things I, I was going to say is like you just you, you talked about great books. You have to not just read, but you have to reread the great books. Yes. Amen. And this. Yeah. This is something that. Um, was impressed upon me by Mortimer Adler early on. Uh, I'll never forget his quote because he was talking about the ethics, which we just did a series on, right? He said, right. you have to read the ethics at least 12 times. I still have no idea why he picked 12 as that number, yeah. right? But he's like, yeah. that's what it was. At least 12 times, you have to read the ethics. And it can't be 12 times in one year. It's got to be 12 times, you know, through the course of 30 or 40 years or something like that, right? So true, man. Like, I thought I had a pretty good grasp on... Uh, you know, even Plato, the number of times I've, I've gone through Plato. But since we did the Republic together, my thinking has both shifted and I think deepened yeah. uh, in relation to Plato just from spending more, again, even more time with it, but also more time yeah. with it with somebody else who spent more time with it than I have. Yeah. You, right? right? So that that is right. the first thing I thought of. Like you have, if you want to be a good philosopher, you want to think like a philosopher, you have to read the great books. And Adler has a, a great list of the great books at the, at, at the end of his book, How to Read a Book. So you can just start there. Yeah. You have to read and reread the great books. I don't know. Maybe you have uh, a minimal effective reading list there. Or Oh, gosh. Get your you, thoughts. Yeah. I mean, let me say this first. Is, is so, you know, as you know, Pat, I've been, I've been interacting with somebody uh, quite a bit about the, about their public in the last right. week yeah. so. Yeah. And um, just that interaction has gotten me, like, rethinking quite a bit. And, and I'm teaching the Republic this fall, right? Which means I'll do a cover to cover reading of the Republic this fall. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm absolutely like giddy with excitement to do it, right? And because because I'm now because like new thoughts about the Republic have like been catalyzed by this conversation I'm having with somebody else about it, right? Yeah. And and now think of it, the first time I read the Republic would have been the fall of 1993. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, God, and how many times have I read that thing since then? And it's it's just inexhaustible. It's been yeah. a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, minimal, minimal uh list of, of minimal titles. effective yeah. great books reading lists from Dr. Yeah. Jim. I mean, you already mentioned yeah. uh Plato and Nietzsche, so we got those yeah. two, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I would definitely And that's right, I would agree with that. Republican and yeah. genealogy would be from those and, two. Mm -hmm. And it's gotta be effective, right? So I can't I'm not gonna like uncork Aristotle's metaphysics. 
right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, mm-hmm. they don't. I mean, that would be hard just to turn yourself loose with. For Aristotle, I would just pick the ethics, honestly. Yeah, I would go the ethics, right? Yeah. And as as we talked about yesterday, is is really in book nine or book ten of the ethics, it's his theory of everything is there too, mm-hmm. right? You know, so yeah, I like uh, you know, just Plato's Republic, Aristotle's ethics, right? Yep. Um, and you know, just, we're just like going minimalist here. You know, from the medievals, I think uh minimally like the first 18 questions of the summa yeah that's good right Mm -hmm. you know like get 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 thomas's philosophy of god Mm -hmm. right you know and i think that's something like the the reasonably diligent person can sit down with right Mm yep i think it's the first 18 right is is gets you through the simplicity and all that right Right. Mm -hmm. um and then like early moderns uh i would do uh descartes descartes discourse on method right uh, Leibniz, um, let's go monadology just cause it's the pocket edition, right? right. Uh, Hume's two, uh, uh, two essays, right? Easy, quick, right? Um, Kant and I, and I'm, I'm going to lobby that we do a series on this next is one essay by Kant. I think gets you everything you need. Right. And that's how to orient oneself in thinking, mm-hmm. right? Easy 10 pager, right? Um, and then Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. That would probably be my like. If you if you spent a year just working on all that stuff, like you would have a good start. You would be a much better philosopher at the yes. end of that, undoubtedly, yes. inevitably. No, I love that. Yeah. That's that's yeah. that's awesome. I would maybe slip in Boethius, yeah. consolation of philosophy. Yeah. That's pretty much yeah. the the only other thing. Yeah, I you know, you know, actually, man, phew, let's let's make that mandatory. Let's not slip that in because. Mm-hmm. If you want the medieval worldview, you need to have the Neoplatonized piece. Yes. Otherwise, right. you're just going to read Thomas as an Aristotelian, which I think is a mistake, right? So you right. need Boethius. Yeah. And 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 Thomas draws so heavily from Boethius in yep. so many ways, both yep. explicitly and I would argue implicitly. Yeah. So the yeah. consolation's got to be in there. Yeah, and it's just yeah. such a good. I'm I'm. I'm back at it. I'm going through it again. It's a book that I, that is my one that I just keep returning to again you, and again and again. Have you ever read John Marenbond's, uh two volume history of medieval philosophy? No. Mm-mm. I, yeah, that the first volume on the kind of pre scholastic, you know, up to Anselm stuff. Boom. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right, so there's your uh, reading list, gentle listeners. Let's do a few more things and we'll hit yeah. your questions. So keep the questions yeah. coming. Um, what else do I have? Oh, here's the here's another big thing, Jim, that I, th- mm-hmm. I think is important. Don't outsource your thinking. Now, this is kind of yeah, ironic nice. because we're asking people to send us their questions. Yeah, here we but, are. But, yeah. but, I mean, you get this a lot. Uh, I know. I, I get it a lot where people just want you to give them the answers. Yes. Right? They, they just don't want to think through anything themselves. This links up to a really good piece of advice that I got. Uh, as a guitarist when I was young. And it was that when you want to learn something, don't outsource it to your teacher or to some video on YouTube or to some tablature or the guitar. What you do is you put the record on, you listen to it, and you figure it out because that struggle, that process will make you a better musician. It will train your ears. It will give you your, your own style. That is how you become a guitarist, a musician. Same thing with philosophy. If you're just looking to other people for the answers all the time and you're not actually wrestling with any puzzles or problems yourself, if you're not trying to give arguments yourself and construct a solution yourself, you're not doing philosophy. And it doesn't even matter yeah. if what you do is good at first. The first time you try and figure out a song, you're going to suck at it, right? Yeah. But you have to engage at that process. You have to be willing to not outsource you're thinking to other people if you want to be a philosopher. You have to. So even if you do ask other people, which you will inevitably, at least do yourself the service of spending time of really struggling with something and trying to answer it yourself before you start bringing in other people for help. What do you think about that? Uh, amen, 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 right? Uh, and I think that's actually just another way of putting my opening rant, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. like, like philosophy, you know, it, you're not striving for that kind of like, you're not accepting the dark critical questions required for self-knowledge if you're outsourcing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I, I I find very often with my students, they are looking for an authority to tell them what to think. Yes. Right. Uh Right. And especially in in the, like the kind of institution I teach at, right. Like we've, they've basically borrowed a great deal of money on the assurance that there'll be authorities here to tell them how to think. Right. And, and, and when I refuse to do that, I think it frustrates a lot of them. Right. Uh And, and well, what, what is, what is the right view about this or that? I'm like, that is not my jam to do that for you. Right. My, my, my thing is to force you into like a, a self-critical moment, 
right? Uh, and you know, it's not it's not a spectator sport. It's not it's not about going and getting a piece of information, right? It's 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 this dispositional lifestyle to never accept your own BS. Yeah, dude. And I'm in a fortunate position as you are that I, I'm connected with and good friends with a lot of people who thought about things very deeply. That often when I'm struggling with something like. I know I probably know somebody who has thought about this, yeah, yeah, you know, deeply and probably has the answer. But I always try to answer it myself and come up with what I think the solution is. Like Jim, how often do I really bug you to an answer to a problem? Oh yeah, I mean, I do the same too, right? Yeah. But yeah, but yeah. but I, I almost never do bug you though, right? No, not the right? answer, yeah. yeah, like yeah. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, right? yeah, it, right. It, like, and yeah. and it's not because not, I don't respect you. In fact, I think you have thought about these yeah. things a lot. So like the temptation yeah. is there is like, oh, I could probably just get the answer from Jim. Yeah. But as Jim will tell you, I'm not constantly just bugging him about yeah, stuff. No, 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 no. Even stuff yeah. where he spent a lot more time, because it's really important for me that I'm developing my thinking on something. But then yeah, like once I feel like I've got something then I want to make sure that I'm not just selling myself a load of BS. And then I'll be like, Hey guys, what do you, what do you make of this and, after and, the fact, but only after I've really actually tried to struggle with something and answer it for myself. Do I do and, that? And right. for, for young people who are, you know, maybe listening to this, who are uh, entering into, you know, actual professional life in the academic industrial article complex. Right. Okay. Um, offload as little of your thinking and your scholarship as you possibly can because that's how you prevent yourself from getting embarrassed in public someday right so if you just like if you just like take someone's word for it as to what's going on in Kripke's naming and necessity and like then you like start you know mentioning it someone somewhere someplace in a conference or somewhere is going to call you out and ask you a question about it and you're over your head right right so in general I think just at for young scholars if you ain't read it don't cite it yeah, Even, that's and I'm not saying it's plagiarism. Okay, you right. might be right. That's the source. But if you haven't read the source, then and it's integral to what you're doing, then you should not write that paper till you've read the source. Yeah, dude, yeah. it's such good advice. And like, it nothing good comes easy. That's the other thing yeah. I was going to say is that philosophy is not easy. And if you think it's easy, or you think you've got an answer easily, that's how you know you're ignorant. And like. Yeah. That 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 is the one thing you can know for sure about philosophy. If you think yeah. that you you've gotten easily to any answer in philosophy, all that means is that you have not spent enough time yeah. with the with the actual problem, right? That 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 we can know with certainty, right? Um, good stuff. Anything else you want to you want to add? I mean, there's other things like study logic. Yes, I think everybody should have yeah. a decent study logic. You should practice making and breaking arguments, and this is important. Um, you do want to like, you know, do your basic philosophical homework, do your Euler circles, try and, you know, put sentences in their logical form, analyze propositions. I think all that is useful exercise building, right? Uh, but I also want to say, don't just play skeptic all the time. I see a lot of people do that. I think it's, it's, it's always easier to be the skeptic than it is to actually try and build something. So I want to say, as a philosopher, do try and, and contribute something. You try and build something up. Important yeah. to be critical as well. That that is yeah. an important skill. Yeah. But I'm I'm always far less impressed with people who are just taking shots at different positions and never actually offering or building something themselves. Yeah. So it's got to yeah. be a, a both end, I think, if you're serious about doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and on the study of logic, you know, I've come to have a, a view about it that it's it's more like uh, what drilling really basic stuff in jujitsu like shrimping or hip hip escaping is right you know when you first start jujitsu than it is to like actually like what you do in a round right yep here's what i mean is uh you know in jujitsu you know like you 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 drill the crap out of this like shrimping up and down the mat especially when you first start and like you'll you'll drill these like really perfect arm bars off your back and stuff like that and then as soon as you actually start to roll, you realize like th this rarely happens as you drill it. Right? Exactly. So what was the point of the drilling? It was just to get your body somehow familiar with like the basic movements of this, of this game. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even though it's not, you're not necessarily ever going to like formally shrimp. Okay. That's maybe, right. okay. You know what I mean? Or formally do a <laughs> yeah, nine yeah. step arm bars. Yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you've got to get your body conditioned to do something like that. Something in the vicinity. Right. Uh, that's my view about like formal logic. You know, like pretty rarely when I'm writing, do I sit down and like draw up the modus tollens, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and now maybe because there's just so much of my background now, I don't have to, right? But I think what all that stuff does is it's just, it's like, it's like kettlebell swings for the mind. It's like jujitsu drilling for the mind. It's like getting your mind in a certain condition of sharpness, right? 
Um, and it's not, it's not like you, like you make your students do the Euler circles or the, or the Venn diagrams, uh, or truth tip, God forbid truth. We just have to quit. <laughs> Why are we making people do truth tables? It's, just, right, it's right. insanity. It's just sadistic, but anyway, the truth tables, if there's a point to that, it's simply to sharpen the knife. Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. that they'll have, they can like abstract and critically like distance themselves from something when, when they need it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, similar analogies to music and basic musical drills, right? Learning yes. your scales, your modes, all that. Yeah. There's a sharpening, there's a conditioning, but obviously in application, when you're making interesting music, you're not just running up and down a scalar yeah. pattern. That's yeah. some of the most boring and stuff you could possibly Like literally you have to, to build right? the yeah. callus on your fingertips. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. I mean, but you have to build the callus in the neural pathways, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Good. Let's take some questions, shall we, Professor? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Um, do, 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 do. All right, guys. So, drop drop in any I, and all questions. Can, can I hit one right away? Yeah. Hit it. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I mean, Jim Rockford is becoming yeah. something of a regular feature of this podcast. Brendan I mean, asks, "Is Jim Rockford actually a good detective?" I mean, uh, Brendan. In some ways, I, I just want to say you're better than that question. I mean. It, I mean, is can can the archetype be improved on? <laughs> I mean, like, come on, <laughs> right? Um, he's, he's I mean, the paradigm detective. Yeah. Now, maybe what he's doing is like, is Jim Rockford as a fictional object, right? Um, is he actually a good detective, right, or just fictionally a good detective? But I, but more, I I think of it as right. Um, is you know, was Achilles a good warrior? Well, yeah, even if there was no Achilles, it's still the archetype of the warrior we're talking right. about. Yeah, here, yeah. Right? This, so, yes, is, this yes. is the measure and the standard. This is the measure, right? yeah. Come on, man. Right. <laughs> so what was the last episode that I just I just watched? Oh, it was season two gear jammers. It was a two parter. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Just, awesome. just, just great. I'm totally hooked on the rock. Were, the, were there truckers? Gear it was the one where they were stealing the trucks. Yeah. yeah I don't course. know if you remember that one. Yeah. Well, Probably. no, it's just, okay. It's the 1970s, right? The term gear jammer was a thing. Think of like George Thorogood and the Jello, Delaware Destroyers. Gear right. jammer, yeah. right? It's, it's a trucker song. Yeah. And think of like, like in the seventies, like trucker movies were the thing. Like think of Smokey and the Bandit. Mm -hmm. and cannonball run and all that right so like right. truckers were cool in the 70s yeah and not only is he the paradigm detective uh but the writing in that <laughs> show is legitimately good yeah. i mean the, the yeah. story arcs are interesting there's 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 like good twists but not cheap you know twists uh yeah. so i'm i'm legitimately a fan of the rock files it's a good the show la the ladies love them Right. How can you he know? not, dude? I mean, yeah. he is your quintessential uh, cigarette uh, smoking, meat eating, trailer park living uh, man's man, dude. Man's so, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Deadly Havoc. I, yeah, I want to get an answering machine now just so like people can leave Jim Rockford style messages on it. <laughs> <laughs> Deadly Havoc says, what is understood by the term physical when encountering physicalism as a worldview? Yeah, this is a good question, Jim. Yeah. How do you start to answer this one? Yeah, I mean, like basically nothing. That's the problem. <laughs> right. This is part yeah. of the problem, right? Yeah. I mean, like, like, like just... naturalism, physicalism, materialism, they have yeah. a big issue trying to define their own boundaries uh, amongst yeah, each mean, other it, within their own paradigm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and keep in mind now, to the point that, uh, you know, like when you get into your, 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 your more recent versions of panpsychism, like they're, you know, they're, they're trying, you know, they, some of them are trying to include conscious states into the physical now, right? And it, or, or, at least coextensive with it right and so um and that's that's a very it's more subtle than that when you're careful but but uh you, you know the the best you're gonna find in this that people are gonna say what the physical is is just what the most up-to-date physics sees as fundamental fundamental in its theories right right mm -hmm. um but then you know if you ask like in what sense does physics study the physical you got a really bad pro thorny circle going here yep. right and so um I, yeah i i don't think there's a terribly good answer abroad to that question right there there decidedly is not right i mean right. people want to say well it's sciencey stuff or physicsy stuff and then you get into this this circular issue that that you're raising right um yeah Hey, there's I mean, a lot. There's a lawnmower running outside. Is that a problem? No, it's it's okay, it's, cool. it's fine, right? And you know, this has been a, a complaint of mine uh, for some time that naturalism really has issues, sort of defining its own boundaries to the extent that it essentially becomes um, meaningless or impossible to refute, and which is an issue we've brought up uh, numerous yep. times yep. before. And, I mean, and clearly at this point, if you continue to define physicalism in a way which some people do, like that, you know, it's an entity marked by certain properties, like a space-time point or mass. 
Uh, that does not comport with the best of contemporary physical theories at this point. So physics itself has already moved beyond that sort of notion of, of, uh, of physicalism or physical entity and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. then you have other people positing certain, I think, features or aspects of reality and calling them physical. When I think at the, at the same time, it, it definitely does not make sense to classify these things as physical unless we completely, unless we're just equivocating on what we have ever meant by physical uh in general right um and you know in a worry for me with this is you know in general um physical and non-physical right in contemporary philosophy are, are interdefined right just you know to be physical is to or to be non-physical is just simply that and be what physics doesn't typically study right yep mm -hmm. but if we don't really know what we're talking about with physical then it seems like we don't really know what we're talking about with non-physical which i agree too right i mean good luck defining non-physical right right and and this this for me fuels my whole thing is like well you know apparently there was a, a big mistake made back in the 17th century okay in parsing the world like this yep and every it's very cool to say that that was a mistake now but yet what are we still doing we're still making the mistake so once again I, and i'm not sure what it looks like to do this but if we're going to stop being cartesian we should stop being cartesian right yeah, man, I, yeah. it's it's funny because sometimes people will object to the natural supernatural distinction, but I actually find that that's much often much better articulated and well-defined than the physical non-physical, right? Yeah. I mean, at least in the Thomistic worldview, we have notions of boundaries and limits versus purely positive perfections. And like, we essentially just have God and then everything else, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's just, you know, it's actually a pr pretty neat thing uh, to make sense of, but it's based on this idea of existential boundaries or essential yeah. limitations right um yeah. that those to me are actually once you understand it from a mystic point of view actually are helpful distinctions but they don't yeah. they certainly don't map on neatly to the various um schools of physicalism that are out so there I, today yeah so i think one of the great losses in the history of philosophy or at least the history of philosophy in the last hundred years is um Merleau Ponty died very suddenly and rather young. I, I think he was maybe 60 years old, maybe just like maybe like maybe 58, 59 years old. And he was writing a book at the time called The Visible and the Invisible. And mm -hmm. there was really only one chapter of that book, like fully 100 percent complete called The Chiasm and uh, just brilliant. And, and he is attempting to like operate uh, in a, an, an understanding of consciousness that doesn't evoke these categories. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, if only we could have seen how that worked out for the rest of the book. Right. So uh, I've recently been in, in, in my attempts to try to like get outside of this. I've been like really trying to figure out that chapter. So you know, if anyone is looking for a challenge, get get a uh, get Merle Ponty's visible and invisible. Yeah. Excellent. Good recommendation. All right. Let's keep going here. Jim, of course, feel free yeah, yeah. to pull up anything you want. Alfonso says, I watched the interview with Thomas Bogardus you suggested, and I'd like to get your personal take. What is the definition of a female or a woman, I guess? How does this account of chromosomal, how does this account, I think, for chromosomal and hormonal abnormalities? How is sex related to the essence of human being? How should someone intersex be raised? Okay, so that's sort of a, a tissue of different questions here. Um Let's take them. Let's take them in order. What is it? What is a woman? Well, you mentioned uh, female. Oftentimes, a woman is defined as an as an as an adult human female. Some people think that that's a circular definition. I don't think it is because we're not reusing the same term twice. You'd have to argue that female is literally synonymous uh, with woman, which maybe it is. But either way, it doesn't bother me too much because I think um, it's better to have an essentialist definition that a, that a woman is someone who's oriented towards a particular biological role, the production of female gametes, something like that, under natural conditions. And uh, th that type of definition, uh, an essentialist definition or a teleological definition is sometimes called, that can handle all sorts of issues of abnormalities and defects, just as all essentialist definitions can, right? That things can go wrong. Things can be, there can be sort of epistemic fog, even if there is a hard metaphysical fact of the matter. So if you have an, an intersex person, yeah, epistemically, it might be hard to tell what the case is, but there's still some metaphysical fact of the matter, even if we can't see what it is. Uh, so I think that's how you you can deal with all that stuff in, in one sort of simple, um, simple sweep without defining a woman based on chromosomes, which I think is a mistake. The chromosomes would be something like, uh, uh, 
Would it be appropriate, Jim? No, no, it can't be. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it depends how tightly you think appropriate is tied to the yeah. essence of something. So yeah. on on some accounts, it, it would be appropriate. But either way, and, uh, and, and also mm-hmm. I would, you know, I mean, chromosomes are part of a moving target theory, right? I mean, not right. one we're likely to give up anytime soon, but that mm-hmm. could be corrected someday, right? And surely we knew what women were or men were before we had a, the slightest inkling about chromosomes 100 percent. yeah you know Mm -hmm. yeah and my understanding of the the various science of this is that they are evolving uh especially they have been for some time along uh away from this idea of genetic determinism and stuff like that so uh i would have independent reasons for avoiding uh that strong of an identification but no so once you have an essentialist definition you can make you can easily make sense of of abnormalities and that i mean we sort of need an essentialist teleological definition to even make sense of the notion of abnormality to begin with yeah. right if, if there isn't yeah. directedness then we we can't we can't say that anything is falling short that there's any yeah. defect here and this is why this this transgender ideology is so pernicious on so many it's it really is a the evil i don't use the, the term demonic that much but uh, i'm willing to use it in a lot of this ideology it's just it's just so disgusting in so many ways and that's again not to say that anybody who struggles with legitimate gender dysphoria that's a different issue and a person struggling individually with an issue that's one thing this rampant disgusting ideology right that often takes advantage of those people is an entirely different thing right so let's be careful with these distinctions uh but i mean like dang man all of medical science depends on the notion of normativity right Mm -hmm. if you want to start denying uh this these essentialist sort of directed teleological definitions then you don't really ever treat anything, right? You can't really treat or cure things. You just change things, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? And that isn't that isn't that is neither true nor is that a basis for medical science. So I want to say, like this whole ideology that's pushing this transgender nonsense is not only just fundamentally philosophically incoherent, but it really hits at the underpinnings of all medical science. As I like, don't <laughs> yeah, oh, no, sorry, Jim, I've been rambling no, no. for a bit here, but chime in. No, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, uh, I think the question that the listener raises is legitimate and I, and I have nothing, nothing to add to your answer, but also, you know, I guess the w- one thing I would put is uh, if I'm understanding it right, like intersex is where you literally have somebody who is like on the, uh, at least in appearances, biologically in between, right? Like the parts have kind of shown up, <laughs> right? Not where they normally do. Am I right? right. right? Yeah. Yeah. But okay. So that's, but, what I want to note about that, that has nothing to do, I think, with like the, what we're seeing popularly de- being debated today about gender identity. Right. So because right. like because what we're, what, what, what's being done now is saying it's not like we're saying, hey, you know, intersex individuals are the yeah. focus of attention here. It's people who are not intersex biologically, but have an emotional sense. Right. An emotional right. tie to themselves <laughs> as one or other gender. Right. Right. Uh-huh. So you could you could like have whatever view about intersex, but like still have whatever view you want about gender. I mean, that that's the right. That's the, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the tie in is that people yeah. use the intersex cases as yeah. sophistry I for know. gender ideology. See, that's right? my that's, point is, is yeah, like, yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Is like I, I think be careful of not you, but like the, the question like taking the bait here, because like you could get very tough cases at the biological level, but that has nothing to do with what's going on politically right now. And also notice intersex is like, okay, you have some male parts and female parts, but that's still male, female, right? Yeah. There's no like, new thing parts. coming yeah. in here. Yeah. It's still binary, exactly. right? Yeah. And that's the point where I say like epistemically, it might be hard to say, okay, what is the sort of metaphysical fact here? But just because there's that epistemological issue doesn't mean that there's no metaphysical fact of the matter. It just means we've just got a messy issue where something has gone wrong in this case. So it's by no mean a, a sort of um, a point that can't be overcome. We have a visitor. Come here. Jim, can you pull up the next question? Let's see here. Uh-oh. Uh, I, I know. I'm, I'm in your room, honey. Hello. Can... Okay, this one. Uh, how would you respond to an objection to natural yes, law given the seeming immorality of sugar-free chewing gum, right? Um, I'm not – I mean, so I, I think I've heard objections like this in the context of debates about contraception, right, where, like, we, we'll hear people 
argue that what you have in contraception is an attempt to take like the 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 pleasure effect of sex but leave aside its natural purpose right and i've heard i've heard people use the example of diet soda or light beer right so isn't diet soda or light beer an attempt for taking away um the you know like having the pleasure of drinking a beer or having the pleasure of drinking a coke without like the consequences of the actual nature of the substance that you're drinking right the sugar okay and i've heard i've heard those kinds of arguments all right uh i've never heard it as like in a general objection to natural law but i've heard it i've heard it uh as objections to natural law like versions of arguments against contraception okay so on this sort of thing, I'll admit, I don't think very much about these kinds of problems, right? But I will say is this is one of those places where I, I guess I'm less of a natural law guy and more of like a classical Aristotelian virtue guy, all right? And so for me, the because I think what's going on in these kinds of arguments is they're trying to say there's this analogy between like, like contraception and uh, diet soda, all right? Or contraception and sugar-free gum, okay? And okay, fine. But for me, the question isn't how something falls vis-a-vis -vis some definite moral law, okay? It's where something falls in the economy of a good life for human beings, okay? Uh, and I would say if, if indeed uh, sugar replacements still leave you with like an overall kind of like gluttonous um, overindulgence attitude toward or uh, like relationship towards food and gustatory pleasure – then yeah, I think I think it's it's probably not a good thing, right? Okay, because uh, it's 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 rehearsing a bad disposition. Okay, and likewise, I would say like like something like you know contraception in the context of marriage, right? Very may very well leave you with like sort of bad consequences in the overall economy of the good life, right? Um, so in a lot of ways, I'm willing to like take the analogy because I think because I don't make these kinds of arguments based on like hard and fast natural law kind of considerations. Sorry, I'm a little distracted by this min by this minion here. Uh, so, my, I guess it will depend how this objection is formulated, and I don't necessarily um, have I don't have any issues with what you just said, Jim. I think yeah. a, a natural law perspective should always be housed within a, a broader, obviously Aristotelian virtue um, virtue based paradigm. That said, if it's if it's operating against, uh, say, your traditional argument against the perversion of a faculty or the essential ordering of an act towards its end, I think this is a disanalogy, right? Because we don't have uh, a clear perversion of, of any faculty here, not like the digestive faculty or anything like that. So if it's trying to argue a structural parallel against the perversion of faculty with, say, certain um, sexual activities, I think it's going to break down because you you just you just don't have that in chewing the sugar-free gum. Uh, you right. would have it in the sense of something like uh, bulimia or something right. like that, right? Yeah. But you don't have it in the case of just chewing gum, which can be used to, for example, yeah. keep your teeth healthy, which is part yeah. of yeah. a good activity. Yeah. It's not perverting the faculty of, say, uh, digestion or nutrient assimilation or something like that. So I would just need to see this objection spelled out in a little bit more detail. But if it's aiming at the the PFA, the perverted faculty argument, I think it's going to it's going to yeah. break down a kind and, of analysis. And, right? and I think we're in agreement. It's like the real question is what does the artificial thing hold for the overall background of like the economy of the good life that, that you're in. Right. Right. Yeah. If I'm cleaning my teeth, it's like yeah. brushing my teeth. Right. I'm not, I'm yeah. not. Yeah. It's just, I, yeah, I don't think it's, it's going to be relevant to uh, an objection or uh, for the position of natural law that claim actions like lying or certain sexual behavior are always intrinsically disordered. That's not going to be the case with chewing gum. That's yep. what I'm saying. Yep. Right. Exactly. Yep. Good. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Good, good, good. Cool. Let's keep moving. So <laughs> I knew I was there. She is again. Come here. So we're just gonna have to deal with it today. My my That's child right. here is just gonna join us, and now she's got a space helmet on. A little bus. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll take a few more here, and then I'll figure out what to do with these rascals. Yep. It's Jim, you're, of, you're 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 in charge for here. Yeah, but a lot of it. It looks like it's mostly just uh, conversation among the audience. Let's see here. I'm not seeing a whole lot. Oh, here's one. Um. Are there any philosopher, uh, Eastern philosophers that you've found beneficial? Reading? Uh, oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've had very good run with the Tao Te Ching, right? Um, Upanishads, I, I've had a look at, right? Uh, I find those very helpful. Uh, 
I think a great way in is a lot of the Thomas Merton stuff on Eastern philosophy. I have found very, very helpful and interesting. So I would you, uh, would you recommend seven story mountain to the, yes. to the people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I remember reading that. That was actually interesting you brought that up because that was, it, it was one of those bridge books for me because um, I actually very much was hugely interested in religious pluralism and many Eastern philosophies yeah. uh, before yeah. I became Catholic. I mean, a big, uh, book for me, influential. I, 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 I still think it's a book worth reading, although I think it gets many things just factually wrong, historically wrong, is Huxley's Perennial Philosophy. Have you ever read that one? Yes. Yeah. I still think that's a pretty decent book, and that influenced me for a long time and, and set me off um, exploring many different Eastern philosophies. I think it was Lewis, wasn't it Lewis, who, who mentioned that it's like, at the end of the day, either Christianity is true or Hinduism is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's pretty much right. Right. I yeah. think I think I think like a, a really a sophisticated religious pluralism like Hinduism is like the best, th most yeah. philosophically interesting religious perspective that I've ever uh, seen outside of, of Catholic uh, Christianity. So Taoism, I study a lot of Taoism. I think it's very interesting. Buddhism is a big tent. I mean, there's lots of different philosophies within within the Buddhist traditions. Um, so I I think. Yeah, yeah, you stay up there right now. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that there are many Eastern uh, philosophies worth studying, and I'm going to try and get Tyler McNabb on soon, who who just wrote a book, uh, claiming that there's more compatibility that people may think uh, between even Buddhist philosophy uh, <laughs> and classical theism. Now, I have to say, I've never seen that or thought Spoiler, that in my own yeah. studies, yeah. Uh, but I want him to come on and, and make his case, and we'll see if he convince, you know, can convince me. <laughs> um, I'll say this is I, I should have thought this off the bat is this isn't a classical uh, Eastern philosopher, but there's a there's a Kyoto school Japanese philosopher which kind of puts him in a Zen Buddhist line by the name of Keiji Nishitani, right? That actually have a chapter on this guy in my new book, right? <laughs> Um, and he's an interesting guy kind of working at intersections between, uh, 20th century phenomenology and his tradition. So, so that, that guy is probably the e the single Eastern figure I've spent the most time with. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's take one more comment or question here, Jim, unless you got anything else and then we'll no, wrap no. this one up. No. And, uh, so Duong just says I'm 80% through Norris Clark's person and being one in the many and explorations has changed my outlook on reality so much. I'm awesome. Uh, I'm just super glad to hear that Norris Clark was a huge influence on me. I think his exploration, uh, his explorations in metaphysics is just an absolute must read uh, for anybody interested in certainly philosophy in general, but but the Thomistic tradition more broadly. It's just it's brilliant. It covers it's very generalist, too. You've got philosophical anthropology. You've got Thomistic epistemology. Uh, you've got obviously metaphysics, natural theology. And he, he wrestles with some, you know, thorny in the weeds uh, issues concerning philosophy of God as well, including how how can we maintain strong simplicity in relation to God's contingent knowledge of creation and stuff like that. So he's willing to really roll up his sleeves and do some some heavy lifting, too, but keeps it accessible and an enjoyable read throughout. So have you spent much time with uh, with uh, Norris Clark yourself, Jim? I have read one of the many and I've used it as a textbook in a metaphysics class. Let's, uh, let's finish with this, Jim. Hot dog, is it a sandwich or is it not? i go sandwich. I think you've got, you've got meat trapped between bread there, right? But does the bread have to be separated at both ends? I think that's what people will typically try to get you huh. at with, with this question, right? Huh, if it's, if it, yeah. <laughs> this is a, lot a hard of, one. Lot of time, A lot of times, like, like, you know, when you like have a sloppy Joe, right? Mm. Um, the, the the bun will still be connected. I've seen that. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Now you mm -hmm. can bite the bullet and say that's not a sandwich, but that's a hard that's a hard call. Hey, here's one for you. In your part of Wisconsin, do you find the sloppy Joe often referred to as the hot tamale? Dude, uh, no, actually, and I do not find sloppy Joes as nearly as often as I would like here in Wisconsin. Really? To be honest, yeah. Where I grew up in Wisconsin, that northeast corner there, right. Uh, very often, like you'd see, you know, there would be hot tamale day in the church basement, right? Oh, yeah, and that sounds it was good. Basically, sloppy joes, right? So, what do we... Oh, go ahead. No, the last sloppy joe that I had, uh, I had it bunless, <laughs> trying to be a good boy, at uh, at Wahlburgers, which is just a chain. Nice, so. nice, <laughs> nice, <good>. yeah. nice. <laughs>
Excellent. Uh, eating a sloppy Joe from a chain. That's guts. <laughs> It is, but Wahlburgers, dude. I'm gonna, I'm going out, and I'm endorsing Wahlburgers, man. Nice. If you, if you want some just, just a good tasting slab of meat, Wahlburgers, Wahlburgers actually knows knows how to do it. And apparently, I didn't know this, but Mark Wahlberg, who, by the way, I saw that movie Father Stew the other day. Not bad, yeah. not bad. I always get like a little worry, a little nervous about the, like the more modern faith based movies because they tend to be a little bit hokey and cheesy. Yeah. Um, but this one was was good. I'd give it like a solid. 75 percent. so i actually okay. think it's worth seeing but anyway i guess his brother is like a very well-known chef huh and uh so he i he started this this chain so burgers are good and uh sloppy joes are good so nice I recommend nice it, yeah what do you got coming up here before we close this one out professor uh just gonna get ready for my trip man uh that's it right we'll uh, be back next week indeed and In, yeah so we're taking off to michigan on friday when do you get back? And uh, we're, we'll be back by Monday, so it's just going to be a little a little weekend hop across the pond here, uh, see some friends, do some things. Uh oh, did we lose Jim? Shows he's still there. He'll be back in a minute. Um. So yes, gentle listeners, there will be no more no more streams this week, probably for uh, for philosophy for the people or or elsewhere. But we will be back on the normal schedule next week. And uh, while we're waiting for Jim, I might as well introduce our special guest here. Come here, honey. You want to see? You want to see what we're doing? This is Marin. How old are you? I'm Marin. Yeah, that's your name. How old are you? Are you are you two or are you three? Two. You're two? Hold those fingers up. Yeah, two. Right. And what can you do? Can you sing uh, The Bare Necessities? Yeah, man. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks for putting on a little bit of a talent show here at the end of uh, Wacky Wednesday. So I know I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm in your room, right? This is your room. What am I doing up here? This is this is this is your space, right? I should get out of here. I should get out of here. All right, guys, we're going to we're going to close this one off. Can you say bye, Marin? Can you say thank you for tuning in? Thank you for tuning in. All right, guys. All right. Thank you all for tuning in on Wacky Wednesday. We had a blast, and we will be back with you next week. Say bye. Bye. Bye.